All right, well, um, welcome everybody. I'm going to go ahead and um, get started. <clears throat> so um, my topic this afternoon is exploring Jordan, Council of, Academ uh, Council of American Overseas Research Centers opportunities for faculty. I was really fortunate this past um, January to be the recipient um, of a fully funded faculty development seminar um, opportunity um, to travel to Jordan. And this was an opportunity that was offered through the Council of American Overseas Research mm -hmm. Centers. <clears throat> so the opportunity was for a 15 day, um, all, all expenses paid trip to Jordan with the goal of really um, coming back to my home institution and um, globalizing the curriculum. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, today, this is going to be part travelogue and part um, informational for those of you who might be interested yourself in pursuing one of these opportunities. And at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can apply for these opportunities. Um, so first, I'm going to talk a little bit about what the Council of American Overseas Research Centers is. <clears throat> the Council of American Overseas Research Centers is an umbrella name. It's um, given to an organization that coordinates um, the activities of almost 30 independent overseas research centers, um, mostly in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. Each, each of these is American in origin and really uh, sponsors all different kinds of research opportunities. Um, there are uh, sites in the Middle East, including Jordan. Um, there's also um, one in Egypt. There are sites in Turkey, Palestine. There are also um, sites in um, Africa, including Senegal, um, Asia, India, Myanmar, um, Bangladesh, Cambodia. Um, there are some in the Amer Americas, including um, Mexico as well. So what I'm going to share with you really briefly is a film clip about the um, activities of the Council of American Overseas Research Centers so that you can find a little bit more information about what they do. All right, um, so that's a little bit about what KORC does. Um, as the video alluded to, KORC essentially gets um, grant funding from the government to support these fully funded um, uh, faculty development uh, seminars, which are open both to community college 
and minority serving institution faculty and administrators. Um, when I applied, KORC had three opportunities they were running um, this past January. One was um, a trip to Senegal, one was a trip to India, and the third, which I attended, was the trip to Jordan. You could only apply for one. Each seminar had a slightly different theme. Um, the theme of mine was um, sustainability in Jordan, and I'll be talking a little bit about the seminar theme. On my particular trip, there were 12 faculty and administrators. That is not necessarily the case for all of the faculty development seminars. Some are a little bit bigger, some are a little smaller. Um, the research organization in Jordan, the American Council of Oriental Research, had specifically asked KORC for 12 participants because they thought that was a nice size group. And so um, KORC chose from um, a pool of about, I think there were about 100, a little over 100 applications. They chose a group of 12 of us. We represented 11 different colleges and universities. Again, they were all um, faculty who were from community colleges or minor minority serving institutions. Some of us were administrators. Um, there was myself and this associate dean from another um, institution. Um, there were also full-time faculty as well as adjunct faculty because this is also open to adjunct faculty. We uh, represented a wide range of disciplines. Um, people on our trip included a faculty associated with English. We had um, a couple of biologists on the trip. Um, we had religious studies scholars. We had somebody with a background in fashion merchandising. We had somebody with an agricultural background. They really tried to diversify the disciplines that people represented. Um, because the idea for all of us is to, within the next couple of years, to develop a project that stems from the seminar that we're going to bring back to our home campus and use it to help globalize uh, the curriculum. So this is um, a photo of um, my particular group. You'll see a few others of us as we go along. Um, you'll also notice that the dates of our trip were from January 2 to 17. Um, it was very interesting because Prior to going to Jordan, I had done a little research. I knew that um, even though Jordan is in the Middle East and um, in kind of a tough neighborhood, you know, it borders um, Syria and Iraq and Saudi Arabia and Israel and Palestine. I knew that um, it was fairly safe. Um, so I didn't really have any qualms about going. I was sitting in the airport um, actually ready to depart from my flight for Amman. I think I was in the Baltimore airport, um, ready to depart from my first flight. And I started to hear the news about um, the drone strike on the Iranian, um, the Iranian uh, commander, Soleimani. And I didn't realize what that would actually do for my trip, uh, but I ended up actually being over in Jordan uh, when Iran was fi uh, firing missiles at Iraq and um, the US Embassy actually um, told us that we had to stay indoors completely one day. And I'll talk about that in a minute, but it was actually a really interesting time to be in Jordan, um, given kind of the geopolitical moment that we were in. All right. Um, so while we were in Jordan, we were housed at the American Center of Oriental Research um, in Amman. It was both where we were literally housed because it is a huge three-story building that has hostile accommodations for uh, researchers, for uh, fellows who sometimes are there for as much as a year, um, engaging in various research projects for people who are just visiting like ourselves. Um, the American Center for Oriental Research also rents out its facilities to journalists and other people who are just uh, traveling through Jordan. Um, in fact, when I was there, there was actually a very prominent um, journalist who was staying on the premises there. We um, actually can't talk about who it was who was staying there, um, but we actually had a very prominent um, journalist who was there um, doing some research um, as well. So it was really interesting. There were a lot of people who were doing all kinds of interesting types of research and made for really fascinating dinner conversations as everybody would sit around the table and talk about the various projects that they were engaged in. So in addition to having living quarters, um, it has 
dining facilities on premises complete with its own chefs. Most of our meals um, when we were in Amman were actually there. Um, there's also a research library on prem premises. It's actually one of the best libraries in the Middle East is located in this particular building. And um, for those of us who are interested in doing research, it was fabulous because we could literally, if we wanted to, go down to the second floor where the research library was housed at midnight, if we wanted to, and go look at the books and you know pick things off the shelves and um, just have access to this incredible library at our um, fingertips. Um, there's also an archeological laboratory on premises um, where they do restoration projects. And you'll see some slides of that in a minute. And um, they also have some other interesting projects going, including a digital image repository um, that uh, researchers can use um, essentially um, open access images of Jordan for um, educational purposes. So this was our home um, for most of the two weeks that we were there. Um, I have some pictures here. Um, you'll see on the left, this was kind of the dining kitchen facilities where we would all hang out. And then on um, the right side of the page, you'll see this was actually my room. And the accommodations were uh, kind of basic. They were like um, a dorm accommodation, nothing fancy, but they were certainly adequate. And I was actually really surprised because we each had a single room. And I, I was really not expecting that we would each have our own room, but we were um, spoiled to have our own room and also in suite um, bathroom as well. So um, here you'll see um, a picture of the archeological la uh, laboratory that was on the premises. On the left, um, the woman there is Barbara Porter. Barbara is actually the director. Well, she was at the time, the director of the American Center of Oriental Research. So she um, lived on the premises. That was her home as well. <clears throat> Barbara um, has lived in um, Jordan for quite a number of years. She'd been the director for a really, really long time, but she actually just retired and she is um, now based in DC. But she was the director at the time. She had requested a seminar in Jordan, kind of as a way of saying goodbye to Jordan. And you know, she took us all around to all of her favorite spots in Jordan, and it was kind of her swan song. So um, this again, this was a core. This is where we stayed. The first day that we arrived, um, we all arrived fairly late at night. There were two groups of us. They tried to group all the people from all the different locations all over the United States into two flights that would arrive um, at Jordan fairly close to each other. We had one group that um, connected through Paris and arrived together in the my group um, where we um, connected through Berlin and arrived together. So we all arrived fairly late at night and they were very kind um, the first day that we were there. It was a Saturday and um, they let us sleep for most of the day. Um, you know, to kind of sleep off the jet lag. And we didn't actually uh, really get going and start doing anything until about noon. They gave us um, kind of a quick introduction to, you know, how to be safe in um, Jordan, what some of the kind of cultural um, norms that you should pay attention to are. We had gotten some of that before uh, we left as well. They had done um, a Zoom seminar for us um, so that we could meet each other even before we went to Jordan. And then um, they started a WhatsApp group for us so we could all start dialoguing and chatting amongst ourselves. But the first day they were there, they did some recapping. They gave us some house rules, like for women, even within ACOR, we always had to wear long sleeves at all times. You know, we had to dress modestly. Um, they gave us some rules like, you couldn't have wet hair at any time because there are certain cultural assumptions about wet hair. Um, that make it um, not legitimate to go out with wet hair. And, you know, they talked to us about some of those things. And then um, later in the afternoon, our first site of Amman outside the airport was, um, they took us to the Jordan Museum. And I'm just gonna show this slide here. So at the Jordan Museum, we learned a lot about Jordan's history. Um, what you'll see here is some of the exhibits and um, the jar on the right, is um, a jar in which some um, fragments of Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And then on the left, you'll see some actual images 
of Dead Sea Scrolls. And then at the top, uh, you'll see um, kind of a representation of what a Bedouin, um, a traditional Bedouin camp uh, would look like. So these were all images that were taken um, from the museum. It was a really good introduction um, to Jordan so that we can learn about the history and, and the culture. So after that, after we went to the Jordan Museum, um, we had some time that we could go and um, look around at the shops and markets um, of Jordan that evening. Um, we went to downtown Amman. And what you'll see here is just some images of the market. On the left, you'll see um, images of uh, the jewelry, which um, is very prominent in um, downtown Amman. There's a whole section that's like the gold district. And that is because gold is um, used commonly in dowries. Uh, so that's why you'll see so much gold in Amman. Um, you'll see some uh, traditional clothing for sale, um, spices that were available for purchase um, in bulk there. Um, so it was really interesting. We did that our first evening. Um, this was also um, an image from our first evening in Amman. The uh, gentleman on the left, he's kind of joking around there. Um, he was wearing um, a traditional Bedouin coat. He is of Bedouin heritage um, and he's wearing a Bedouin coat, which he modeled for us because some of the uh, gentlemen in our group were so enamored with this coat. It's lined with um, really thick material inside and it keeps people extremely warm. And it was very, very cold when we were there in um, Amman. So some of the guys wanted to know where they could get a coat like his. And so he was joking around and um, modeling his Bedouin coat. And, he was really great. He took um, the guys who wanted to purchase a coat like his um, to one of the shops, found them a coat like this, and you know, told them what a good price would be. So um, every time we went out um, on the town or on some sort of an excursion, in addition to the people who worked at ACOR, the director and the assistant director, we also had um, professional tour guides who would accompany us. This was our first um, tour guide. Um, he was with us for part of our trip, um, and then um, through the second half of our trip, we had a different tour guide. So um, following that, um, we all went home. We all went back to ACOR, relaxed. The next morning, we, had a uh, we got up early for a full day in Amman. Again, this was just kind of a sightseeing day. They didn't really start us with anything too heavy our first couple days while we were still um, jet lagged. Um, this is a scene um, from us at a mosque that we visited that morning. Uh, so this is uh, the group at a mosque. And um, then later that afternoon, we went to um, the Darat al Fanun, which is a very famous art gallery in Amman. And you can see some images there. Um, what's really fascinating about this particular art gallery is that it's built over a hillside in multiple buildings. And, and part of the property of the Dara al Fanun is built on ancient ruins, which you can actually see right there as well. Um, after that, and after we walked around and had lunch downtown, we went to a, a place called Tiraz Museum of Arab Dress, and we learned all about different um, Arab um, uh, clothing norms. We learned a lot about the different stitching and embroidery and um, how to tell which region of the Arab world someone is from based on the kind of embroidery that's done. Um, this particular museum um, was really a labor of love by a woman who um, is a Palestinian immigrant to Jordan. And um, she actually has poured many of her own personal resources into creating this uh, museum of Arab dress. And, um, she lives next door to the museum as well. After we all had the individual um, opportunity to explore the museum, she invited us as a group to um, come over to her home and she uh, made us tea. You can see the woman there, she's wearing um, a black jacket and black slacks and she has a cane. Um, she is the founder and um, the owner of the museum. And she was incredibly gracious to invite us to her home for tea. And um, she also had her own private collection of um, beautiful Arab gowns. And she invited um, many of the women 
in our group to, to try them on and model them. And she talked a little bit about each piece. So it was just incredibly uh, fabulous because this is an opportunity we certainly wouldn't have had if we were just, you know, the average tourist in Jordan. And a lot of this was due to um, the connection um, that uh, Barbara, who is the director of ACOR, has. She really knows everybody in Jordan. She's incredibly well connected and she planned out each place that we would go, who we should speak with, and you know, she was just incredibly well connected. All right, um, so this is just um, another image of the woman's house, which was absolutely beautiful. All right, um, so after a couple days of just sort of acclimating ourselves to uh, the city, um, we spent quite a bit of time actually staying in uh, ACOR and uh, predominantly listening to lectures. There were a few days that we didn't leave the premises. Um, various experts came to us and talked to us about uh, sustainability in Jordan from a variety of different perspectives. I put on the screen um, a sampling of some of the lectures that we attended. Uh, the image that you see here is of our group listening to Rami Daha, who is a very prominent architect, and he was talking about the architectural transformation of Amman. Um, we also had um, a fabulous scholar from the university, Aladin Adawi, who came and talked to us about sustainability from an Islamic perspective. And he talked about how really um, Islam is very much compatible with the notion of sustainability. And he talked about how that was really at the heart of the religion. Um, we also heard from Miriam Abasa, who um, has been a scholar um, sponsored by ACOR and she talked about urban development in the city. Um, we talked to um, someone else who's also um, been an ACOR fellow who talked about the refugee issue in Jordan, which is something I'll be talking about in a minute. And then um, we had um, another um, presenter come in and, and talk about gender in Jordan. And this was not by any means, um, you know, representative of, all, representative of all the lectures that we attended, but this is just kind of a sampling. So you can see um, the diverse array of topics that we were exposed to. Okay, um, so talking a little bit about what we learned about Jordan from a sustainability uh, perspective. Um, we learned about Jordan's um, quest to be sustainable from a natural resource perspective. Um, Jordan is very um, water impoverished. It is actually the world's second most um, water impoverished country. And um, that was something that was impressed upon each of us even before we went to Jordan. We were told that we were not allowed to uh, flush toilet paper down the toilets there. They had like a little bin by the toilet paper, by the um, toilet where you had to throw it. We were impressed not to flush the toilet unless we absolutely had to, um, to do that at a very minimum. We had to keep our showers to under two minutes and we weren't warned to do that. And that is because um, Jordan is so bereft of water. Um, at the same time with global warming, um, there are increasingly periods of extremely heavy precipitation where Jordan will get floods, more water than it knows what to do with. In fact, um, we actually were there at um, kind of a rainy season where um, it had unprecedented amounts of water and there was some flooding. And um, actually there was some snow too while we were there. I think I saw more snow in the Middle East last year than I actually saw in DC. Um, also, um, Jordan doesn't have a lot of natural resources wealth. It doesn't have any oil wealth like um, its neighbors. So um, natural resource um, poverty is definitely um, an issue for, um, for Jordans, for Jordanians. Uh, regional instability is an issue um, as well. Uh, Jordan has over 2 million refugees, um, including a huge percentage of Palestinian and Syrian uh, refugees. Um, actually, I think the majority of the Jordanian uh, populace is um, of Palestinian origin now. 
And in recent years, <clears throat> with the unrest in Syria, um, there have been um, an increasing number of Syrians flooding into the country. Um, there are also some Ye Yemeni uh, refugees and um, some other refugees there. Uh, but this has resulted in just a huge increase in Jordan's population in a relatively short time. There are presently 16 refugee camps in Jordan, 13 of which are Palestinian, um, and some of those have been very long standing. And then three that are more uh, recent in origin, which are Syrian. Uh, because of all this, there's a very um, high youth unemployment rate. You can see the figure there at about 42%. And a lot of um, Jordanians, including doctors and nurses and attorneys, have ended up um, leaving Jordan to go to the Gulf states, um, which has created a brain drain, but there just isn't enough um, employment in Jordan. Other um, problems that we learned uh, that Jordan has includes um, hyper-urbanization. Um, almost half of the formal uh, work enterprises are in the city of Amman. So as you can imagine, that's created a huge um, push for people to come to the cities. Um, that is also coupled with height restrictions on buildings, which has created urban sprawl. The city is going out everywhere and uh, you know the traffic is crazy because of that. Um, but uh, the height restrictions are something that's certainly controversial. There's a lot um, that's bound up with uh, customs uh, particularly for residences, it's not customary to have um, homes that are over three stories, buildings that are over three stories, and that's in part um, to cut down on um, um, kind of anonymous encounters between men and women. So hyper-urbanization hyper is another issue there. Um, there. Again, there's relatively uh, few employment opportunities there. Um, which has also led to a lot of the cultural sites in Jordan being at risk for looting because there are so few jobs for people in some of the more rural areas. Um, so Jordan certainly has issues with sustainability and we um, learned a lot about those. Okay, so um, once we got out and away from Amman, we did some day trips. Um, one of them was to Umm al-Jamal, which is on the Syrian border. And we went there because um, ACOR wanted us to see how various NGOs and partners are trying to address some of these issues. And in Umm al-Jamal, this is um, a town that has some, some ruins, which you can see. They're not very well defined ruins, and uh, but they're trying to make them into a tourist site. And um, there are local organizations, including an NGO, that's trying to capitalize that, and it is a way of bringing jobs to people who live near that site. They're trying to think about what else tourists might do when they come to Um Al Jamal. And one of the things um, that they're um, doing is to uh, partner with women in the local community and um, to have them cook for tourists, invite them over to their homes and to cook for tourists as a way of um, bringing some sort of employment to the region. And so what you'll see here is um, the home of a woman uh, that we went to. She cooked for us, uh, made us a lovely lunch and this was um, part of an effort to show us how they're trying to create sustainable tourist activities that really involve the broader community. This particular uh, group um, actually gives the local women turns um, inviting people to their homes and cooking for them as a way of making money. All right. So I just had to include this slide and why I think this slide is really wonderful is because this particular slide is an image of us sitting around the table at this woman's home, eating this lovely um, meal that she's uh, provided for us. And you can see the image of um, Al Jazeera TV. Um, you can see the image of uh, Washington. And that's because we had made this trip um, at the point that tensions were beginning to ramp up a little bit um, as a result of the killing of Soleimani. And um, we're sitting there in this woman's home having this lovely meal and watching on Al Jazeera while Iranians are chanting like death to America. 
it was kind of a surreal experience being there at that particular moment. All right. Um, also, I mentioned that Omal Jamal was on the Syrian uh, border. These images here I just had to include. Um, we were actually very close to the Syrian border. Um, in fact, on the right-hand side of the page, you can actually see the lights from Syria. We were that close to, um, to Syria while we were there. All right. Um, I should say that after we went to Omal Jamal, we were actually really lucky that we left right before the tensions got really bad with the US. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't have been allowed to go there. Um, shortly after we got back from Omal Jamal, uh, that was when tensions got really high and um, the US Embassy issued an alert to all Americans in Jordan that they were to stay inside for a full day, couldn't go to work, couldn't go to school. And so we were uh, confined to the premises. We were supposed to shortly afterwards leave for a four day excursion um, to go to other sites um, overnight in um, Jordan. And um, we were really not sure if we were going to be able to go, uh, but by that point, the hostilities had gotten a little bit better and we were told that we could go, but we could not tell anyone that we would be going. And we couldn't put anything on our social media account. We couldn't tell anyone where we were going. Um, we could just do it quietly. So um, the next few slides that you're gonna see are some places that we visited um, while we were um, in traveling around Jordan um, um, outside Amman. We went to Mount Nebo and Madaba. Um, some of you are familiar with Mount Nebo because of the um, historical associations um, with um, Moses, who is a key figure in the Islamic, uh, Christian, and Jewish faith. Um, so we went there, and um, what you'll see on the left is an Orthodox church that's actually built on top of the mountain, and it is also home for some of the most amazing um, Byzantine mosaics in all of Jordan. So we had the fabulous opportunity to go there and see those. Um, afterwards, um, we then went to a mosaic workshop where we saw local artisans creating um, uh, the mosaics and really keeping this handicraft alive. So those are those images. And um, then our next stop was um, we went to Petra. And that is actually where most tourists, if they come to Jordan, that's um, what most tourists um, typically go to Jordan for. Um, Petra is considered to be um, one of the seven modern wonders of the world. And um, it's an ancient Nabataean city it, that's carved out of stone, very famous. Some of you uh, have probably seen images of it in movies like Indiana Jones. Um, we went to Petra. Um, to explore uh, Petra, we learned a little bit about sort of um, the dual problems of sustainability. Um, we learned that on the one hand, um, Petra has uh, gotten UNESCO heritage preservation status, which has uh, preserved uh, the ruins um, and provided you know, um, the means to preserve them. On the other hand, <coughs> Petra is, um, an area where a lot of Bedouins previously lived in caves in what is now the prote protected UNESCO heritage site. And as a result of that UNESCO heritage uh, preservation status, it has resulted in the displacement of the local population. And the local population that used to live in the caves, and now they've been displaced to a village um, kind of outside Petra and they come back and they're employed um, typically as like handlers for donkeys or camels or souvenir sellers or something like that. So we kind of got to see um, the dual perspective there. On the one hand, how UNESCO heritage preservation status is good. On the other hand, how it has created some um, problems for the local community. Um, this is Petra. Um, this is the ancient city. Um, what you'll see on the left here is called the Seek. Um, you go through this very narrow passage uh, where um, there's huge stones on each side and you're just like going through a single file. And then all of a sudden um, you'll see the rock open up and um, you'll see the treasury, which is um, the most famous of um, the buildings in Petra. And so I've shown you what you'd see um, kind of in the order that you would see it. Um, I also showed you a little bit more of the park. After we had lunch in the park, um, 
we were each given a, the rest of the day to kind of go explore the park on our own, do whatever we wanted. We were advised to go in twos. Um, there were a number of us who decided rather optimistically to hike up to what's called the monastery. Not a lot of um, travelers actually go there because it's quite um, a vigorous hike. And you'll see um, that you have to go up these kind of step, steep, sandy steps to get to um, the monastery. There were a lot of them. And um, it's also kind of dangerous because some people have tried to take the easy way out and they've tried to go up to the monastery on <coughs> donkeys. And so you'll see donkeys like flying down the, the steps in the order, you know, in the opposite direction and practically knocking you over. So it was a rather steep, arduous um, climb up to the top, uh, but it was, it was amazing. And you'll see some of these images that you can clearly see were worth it. Um, it was an exhausting hike. Um, one of my friends had a Fitbit on. It was, I think, a 12.5 mile hike that day, up and down these steep precipices. But it was, it was just incredible. <coughs> All right. Um, so, also during this overnight tour, um, we ended up going to Aqaba, which is a port city on the Red Sea. Um, it was very interesting because um, Jordan is so water poor, and yet this tourist city on the Red Sea, you can see that there are these beautiful pools and fancy resorts. And um, so again, you can kind of see how there's definitely a need for more sustainable tourism because a lot of the tourist industries that are so needed for people to make money, on the other hand, are um, depleting the country of um, natural resources. And um, you'll just see here, again, the beautiful uh, city of Aqaba. It's just this amazing um, resort city. Okay. Um, we learned a little bit about sustainable enterprises in Aqaba. Um, we went to um, a, a place where an NGO has sponsored um, Palestinian women and um, also um, other refugee women um, who really need income uh, desperately. Um, they've taught them how to make jewelry out of um, recyclable um, products, including like uh, bottle caps and um, uh, glass and things like that. So um, what you can see here is a group of uh, women who are engaged in the art of uh, jewelry making. We also visited the home um, of a local family um, who taught us to cook some um, local dishes. And again, this was a way of um, engaging with the local community and finding enterprises um, that can diversify the business activities at, um, in Aqaba. And um, we learned uh, about, again, cooking uh, with this local family. On the way back from Aqaba, we uh, visit another family home and we had another um, kind of cooking experience. And this was a farm to table uh, sort of experience where we picked our own produce and then they cooked it for us and you can see um, some of the traditional methods of cooking. On the top left, there's a woman making mountain bread over a fire outside. And then um, in the middle, you can see a local, uh, a traditional dish that they bury in the sand and then bring out um, cooked. Um, so you can see that as well. All right, um, our last major place that we went to in Jordan uh, was Jerish, which is the site of um, uh, very phenomenal uh, ancient Roman ruins. Actually, they're considered to be the best ruins outside of Rome, the best preserved. Um, that was the last place we went to. And um, I, I've shown you a couple images here. On the left, there's an image I just have to talk about. It's really interesting because it felt so surreal. We were in Jordan viewing ancient Roman ruins. And while we were there, there were these two gentlemen who were performing in um, this old amphitheater. And one of the gentlemen was playing the bagpipes, which are of course Scottish in, in origin, and he was playing Amazing Grace. So it was, it was quite a surreal moment um, there, but it was you know, a phenomenal experience um, seeing these ancient Roman ruins. And um, I, took a, I included this picture because I thought this was fascinating. You've got this amazing um, uh, Roman ruin site, and uh, yet, you know, people are letting goats um, 
gaze among the the ruins, which um, you know is something that wouldn't just happen everywhere. But it, it was really interesting. There were local shepherds going in and out of the ruins with with their flocks. Um, okay, so um, I'm moving kind of quickly because I want to wrap up so that there's time for questions. Um, coming up. There are a couple of opportunities for faculty to apply for upcoming um, seminars. Uh, they have announced that tentatively, their next um, two um, uh, opportunities that people can apply for, one is um, to go to Senegal, tentative dates May, June, 2021. The application deadline is February 1, 2021. <clears throat> also um, in uh, spring, uh, early summer of 2021, they will be taking a trip to Mexico to learn about indigenous languages and cultures. And again, that also has a February 1, 2021 application deadline. So I wanted to reserve the balance of the time for questions. So if you could either unmute yourself or uh, post a question in the chat, that would be fabulous. Hey, no. <clears throat> Hello? Can you hear me? I can, thanks. You can? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you for sharing this. Um, I, had, I had stumbled upon um, this organization, I guess it was last winter, I was doing some mm -hmm. research for um, a course and <clears throat> I actually did apply for the Senegal trip, but was denied. But mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it's worth trying again, but it looks so interesting. And, and mm -hmm. even more so, I would love to go because, because our students are from all over. And you know, to be able to visit where some of them might be from, I think is so important because it makes you understand so much more about them. Yeah, I definitely think it's worth um, applying more than more than once if you didn't get in the first time. And again, some of it isn't necessarily about your own application. They try to get a mix of, of people from different geographic locations, from different disciplines. Mm -hmm. So you never know um, what they're particularly looking for. I think um, part of the um, trick is also finding a way to connect the theme of the seminar to what you're teaching or what your research interests are. Um, mm -hmm. my, one of my research interests is tourism. So I think that helped me in terms of um, being able to put together an application uh, for Jordan. But I definitely think it's worth applying for again. Yeah, uh, I guess I could try and tie in healthcare. <laughs> yeah, but. and actually um, I think there are, definitely, there are definitely ways to connect that I'm sure. Uh, particularly given the location, um, you know, Africa. Um, yeah, I, I'm sure there are ways to connect that to the theme. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I will also say that um, they vary where they take um, groups. So um, Senegal has come up quite a few times recently, but sometimes it will be many, many years before they um, take a group to a particular country again. I think um, it had been over 10 years since anyone had been um, to a KORC sponsored seminar to Jordan. So if there's something that comes around that you're interested in, apply, don't wait, because you don't know when it will come around again. So Nicole, there is a question in the chat um, uh, about is this, um, available for full-time faculty or is it just for adjuncts? It's for both. It's for full-time faculty, adjuncts, administrators. It's open to all three populations. Um, staff are not, I think, eligible to apply, but faculty, um, including adjunct faculty and administrators are welcome to apply. And I do notice that there are a couple of librarians in this session. I should mention that as faculty, librarians are, of course, um, welcome to apply. And um, actually, I think that um, somewhere like Jordan would be really interesting for librarians to go because um, 
you know, especially because uh, ACOR has one of the most prominent library libraries within the Arab world, right, on premises. So I think that would be really interesting. All right, other questions? Right. Any anything else anyone wants to ask? Ah, somebody said, "What advice would you give to a faculty member trying to assemble a successful um, application?" Um, as I mentioned, what I would really say is connect what you're teaching to um, the themes of your um, of the seminar. So show how the seminar will benefit um, will be a benefit to what you're teaching and or and or your personal research because they want you to really use the information that you get during the seminar as a way of enhancing your home campus. So that's um, the research that I mean the advice that I would give for a faculty member on trying to assemble a successful application. I believe um, since I've gone to one of the seminars, um, one of the faculty in my division got accepted to um, a trip to Myanmar as well. Um, so once she is able to go, she should be able to talk about that as well. Um, her trip got postponed because of um, the coronavirus. Okay, I'm seeing another question. What are, what are the follow-up options once you attend? Does the group stay in touch um, with the group and KORC? Um, so let me take the second question first. Yeah, my, my group has stayed in touch. We um, started the WhatsApp um, thread um, before we even went to Jordan. So we all felt like we knew each other even before we arrived. And even since we got back, people are always like texting each other via WhatsApp. So yeah, absolutely. We also get to, to know people at community colleges all over the United States. Um, through this experience as well. In terms of the follow-up options, it's really up to you to develop your own project. They're not prescriptive. Um, all they want to do is you have to um, submit evidence of what you've done uh, within, I think they give you like two years or something like that to, to show how you've integrated the material. All right, I think I have time to take um, one last question. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, thank you so much for attending. Um, it was a pleasure to share this with you, and I hope that some of you will take the opportunity um, to apply for future um, KORC seminars. Thank you, Nicole. All right.